Oh, okay. All right, so welcome everybody to uh, Peace on Earth. Healing from a social perspective or, or a huge goal there. Um, we are a healing house, those of us who are putting this on and Suzanne Frelo and myself, Suzanne, raise your hand, um, are the co-founders of Healing House and Maria Cookson is our uh, secretary treasurer rounding out the board of Halen House and our mission is, um, oh, I'm gonna have a blank there, healing the root cause and effects of trauma, creating health, resilience, and wholeness. So we want to bring these educational sessions to you on a monthly basis covering different areas where trauma can affect your lives and um, help bring you to a place of healing. So by bringing you tools, information, um, and helping you get the, uh, the information and the resources that you need. So um, today, or Suzanne, would you like to say hello? Anything else you'd like to say? No, you covered it. Thank you, Cheryl. Good job. And Very welcome, good. everybody. Good job. I'm so yeah, excited. Welcome, everyone. Okay, yep. good. So we'll get right to our speakers. Today, we have Miguel Hirata from Pacific Source. And Miguel, I'm going to let you um, tell everyone about yourself as well as Don Creech and Elaine Favre. So Miguel, take it away. Yeah, well, thank you so much for the invite. I'm Miguel Angel Rada. I serve at Pacific Source as the health equity strategist. Great. Don? Yes, hi everyone. I'm Don Creech and I'm an independent consultant, um, small business owner. And I think relevant to this conversation too today, I'm also the proud parent of Tyler Creech who's also joining us today um, as a person of color here in Central Oregon. Thanks, Don. Elaine. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Elaine Favory. I am a local chiropractor here in Bend. My practice name is Healing Waves Wellness Center. And I also am a shamanic practitioner as well through um, divine intervention and spontaneous remission. And I'm very grateful to be here with everyone and to be able to share space with you all. Great, thanks Dr. Elaine. Um, Miguel, would you like me to go ahead and bring up the slides for you? Yes, please. Okay. So the, the, the idea, we, we put together for this occasion a series of slides. So the team thought that it was a good idea to begin with a series of uh, definitions, just to clarify the topic of today. So I will, I will uh, try to explain, to set the ground for our discussion. So okay. yeah. One second here, sorry, I'm trying to find them. <laughs> because you, you know, the, the topic of, uh, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. As much as we talk about that, it's everybody's talking about that recently. It's a very new uh, area of knowledge and, and fairly new. I mean, less than 20 years is new, right? So, um, and, the, and the definitions continue to evolve all the time and to include other, other aspects that were not present. Uh, just an example, uh, this uh, past month, so three months ago or four months ago, for the first time, the Health Equity Authority include a definition of health equity for the first time. So just to give you an idea how recent is this knowledge and how, uh, how it's evolving. So the first aspect I think to explain is, is what is diversity? And most of the times we tend to associate diversity only to a uh, to an ethnicity, a race, or a language. But really the terms of diversity is much bigger than that. It's related to minorities, to basically all the minorities that are recognized by the law. And that include even the thinking styles, language, ethnicity, religion, perspective, experiences. So when we talk about diversity, that means that you can look like other people, but you have a different religion, so you are diverse. And then your values and the way you communicate and interact with the world could be different. And, 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 and this is basically what it means. As you know, the next slide, please. 
as you know, uh, our American culture is very diverse. So uh, could, you, uh, could you put that on presentation mode? It's bigger and then- uh, it's Which button do I push here? So on the bottom right, you have a little corner with, uh, if not, it's okay. Uh, there, there. Oh, I think it's, it's okay. the upper right-hand corner, present. Oh, there we go. Sorry, uh, guys. Thank you. So, uh, so diversity basically is recognizing who we are in, uh, in, in, in our society. So all the elements with all the diversity we have around social orientation, uh, disabilities, age, race, color, gender, all that together is diversity. And the other term that usually goes together is inclusion. So diversity and inclusion. So inclusion is like, is, is a little different because inclusion is how we mix these ingredients. So if you think in a, in a cake, so you have a, several ingredients that are different among them, but then the way you mix it, so gives you a different results. And, and so that is why it's so important to think in these uh, two aspects as complementary, but different, because you can recognize that you have diversity, but the way that you create the conditions to include all the voices in the decision-making, that's, that's what makes really the difference. So that's the, that's the term inclusion and diversity. Next slide, please. If you tell me if you have questions or if I'm going too fast, you let me know. Next slide. Yeah, so the, the next uh, distinction that, that is um, useful for us is this is distinction between equality and equity. Equality is a term that uh, lives for, for many time with us. It's, it's basically the, the key word for that is sameness. So it's this idea that to every person, a boat, right? It's like everybody deserves the same opportunity. So that is sameness is the, is the, is the key word there. And if you see to the left of, of your screen, you have a, a family or a group of persons. You have a kid, a woman, a very tall man, and a people uh, that is using a, a, a wheelchair. And so if we apply the equality, uh, uh, concept. So we give to every one of them a bike. And so uh, you see for the kid, it, this is a very difficult bike to ride. The woman seems it, it's, it's kind of okay. The tall man is suffering and the people that is using a wheelchair is left out of the, of the, of the picture, right? So that's why the concept of equity is complementary to equality. So the next slide shows that to every person or every, no, 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 go back. No, no, you need to go back. So continue clicking if you, if you can, yeah, another one. Yeah, yeah. So to the right, you see how equity is working, right? So you give to a, every person what they need or what their suits their needs. So the kid has a, a bicycle to the size and, and so forth, and an adaptive bicycle for, for the other person. Now everybody can enjoy the ride. So this is the basic uh, difference between equality and equity. And this is the reason why we are talking so much recently about equity approaches, equity lens, to approach services and products and, the, and circumstances with an equity lens where all this diversity is finds uh, options to be included in the discussions and in the taking, uh, uh, in the decision power uh, processes. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, the, the other concept we want to uh, explain to you to begin this conversation is about this 
terms that uh, uh, you, you may be have hearing about what is cultural humility or cultural competence or cultural sensitivity. So all these terms basically mean basically the same. I like the term cultural humility most because this is about attitude. Instead, the other ones like cultural competence, well, this is more, this is more difficult to achieve because I would say being Mexican, I have competence in one region of Mexico, but not all regions of Mexico because there are differences. And even less about Latin America. So with so many different countries and, 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 uh, and ways to think. So no, I prefer to talk about cultural humility rather to cultural competence because it is about interest, curiosity, and, uh, and the way that we approach the, uh, the contact with different minorities and with other, with other people. So this is uh, that term. Next slide, please. And now the, we, we, we touch the topic of this conversation because we understand that many, many people wants to know, okay, so I have some interest on diversity. I want to help, I want to support, I want to change my organization, or I want to jump into the opportunity. How do I do that? And, and so this is complex because sometimes you hear groups like Starbucks, you may remember that the Starbucks after this incident last year in, in, in one of the stores, they closed the entire Starbucks in the, in the country for one day to have a training. And so people was, was having diverse reactions to that saying, some of them saying, yes, that's perfect that you have training on diversity for your stores. Other people saying, no, that's not enough. One day training that's, that, that, that will not change the, the culture. Yeah. So, However, so this, this, um, this slide, we try to explain you here that this is part of a progress. This is part of a project for, uh, of how we can approach change. And this uh, model tells us that, um, for instance, what, uh, what Starbucks did on that occasion was very important because it was it was tail, it was saying to people that they care about this problem, they want to engage in a, in a solution, and they did a training. That training counts for me in this. In, if we apply this model, for me it counts like the part of awareness and education. That's very important. However, it doesn't add too much for a change of culture. According to this study, which is very scientific, the, the, the link is there, I invite you to visit that. Uh, they notice that yes, awareness and education, that kind of trainings, it helps, it's important, but it only, it only moves the dial around 5%. If you want to change, it's only around 5%. Then you need to have the right motivation well, what is the right motivation to have? Well, the right motivation means that you really are either because of the policies of your company, either because you have a personal experience that invites you to change, something because you decided, whatever is the motivation, you need to have that to, to sustain that effort of understanding better the tools of equity. And that comes around 30%. But if you don't need if you don't learn the skills and tools, because there are skills and tools related, then the change is still limited. So you need to have that. And so get, uh, get the training, develop the, the tools, uh, skills. As you know, the skills is a, is a, is a complex situation. It's just not, it is not just understanding something, but it's also trying to, 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 to work with them every day and try to develop that in a way that they become your own, like driving a car, right? So you, you, you read the manual to, to, to know how to ride. That doesn't mean that you can ride. You need to practice every day. You go to the school, you learn to, to drive, to, to, to navigate with other people, and then you pass the test and then you continue to learn. I'm still learning, everybody's learning. So that's the second part. And then the culture of or an environment. So if, if you live in a culture or in a structure that doesn't allow inclusion, then your opportunities for change are reduced. 
because you need to have that. Let me give you just an example that I think we can begin the conversation with that. I'm, I, I'm of, often uh, ask, um, uh, people ask me, how do I put more board members in our, in our group? I need more diversity of, of, in my board members. The other day, a group from Portland called me, Miguel, I need someone from a woman from a rural area uh, for this board. Can you help me? I said, well, okay, let me ask you something. What day are your meetings? Well, our meetings are Wednesday at 10 a.m. And where? Well, in downtown Portland. Okay, so now we begin to have problems, right? Because it's possible that a, a, a woman, a, a person of color from Central Oregon that is working maybe one or two or three jobs to make their living, it's gonna be difficult that they, that she can move to uh, downtown Portland on Wednesday at 10 a.m. So you see there are structural problems that are related to that, that, that create that there is an Im impediment, a, a, a factual impediment to be part of that, uh, of that board. So that's also part of the cultural and the environment. Or another example, racism, right? And there is ways to institutionalize racism and segregation. And, and we have many examples of history and we can chat about that. But this is the, the, the AMSO model. And then I think there is another slide. Sorry, I'm taking so much time. Yeah, well, we, we, can, we can keep that for the discussion. So this is some definitions to, to, to begin the discussion and I stop there, thank you. Thank you, Miguel. That was a lot of great information in there. Um, at this point, does anybody have any questions for what Miguel just covered? All made sense. Okay, uh, Don or Elaine, who would like to go next in this conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and maybe how it applies to your work or personal life and how we might be able to um, impart some information for the folks here. Who wants to go first? Don? Would you like to go first? Sure, yeah, I can um, jump in. Great. So I was, um, <laughs> so I was wanting to maybe touch on what we discussed when we had our previous meeting. So that would be in application, I think, personally to the cultural humility slide. Um, and so I'd like to just share a personal experience that I've had since this whole um, last, I guess, how long has it been? Maybe eight months or however long that the Black Lives Matter has kind of come to the forefront. Um, and so a little background information. So I'm um, Hispanic ethnic uh, ethnicity and I'm from the South and I've been in Bend now for um, almost three years, three years in February. And um, for me, it's been, it's been a very interesting process of um, finding my place in this, in this community. And what I've noticed is that pretty, pretty, pretty quickly, I was receiving um, a lot of uh, racist or just, just bigoted kind of interactions with people. And uh, so it's a lot to, to process, um, especially when you've never experienced something like that before. But yet at the same time, you know, there has been a lot of, um, or a couple of instances where people have tried to express the advocacy for um, people of color. And so that's really what I want to broach right now. So there was an experience a few months ago where I was in Target shopping and there was a Caucasian woman with her daughter um, that saw me in the store and decided to approach me and essentially grabbed my arm and just kind of looked at me like deer in headlights. Like she was like, oh crap, I just grabbed this woman's arm. I now need to proceed with like why I'm doing this. And so it was kind of an awkward situation where she was essentially right off the bat was saying, 
I appreciate you. I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate you. So um, before I kind of continue with my response, I want y'all to kind of think about, put yourself in the woman's shoes as you know, a Bendite that maybe is not accustomed to seeing a lot of um, people of color, um, even though a little caveat is that a lot of people on Bend are actually from California where there is a lot of diversity, but I digress. So anyhow, um, so put yourself in her shoes, seeing a, a woman of color um, in the store and wanting to express advocacy. Do you think that that was an appropriate response or do you think that the heart was in the right place, but mm, the application was not so great? And if y'all want to like jump in and give me, give us your opinion, this would be, a, I feel a really great time to kind of like open up more of a discussion before I kind of complete my story. Anyone have like any input that they'd like to add? I would like, you know, I always have something to say. Um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, that was Obviously, I shouldn't say inappropriate because again, you you kind of look going. Well, she wants to say that she appreciates you. She she recognized you're a woman of color, and to say, hey, I'm with you or whatever, and I recognize you, but a little bit over the top, you know. Um, that, but I think we are in this time that we don't know what to say. You know, we're just kind of right. We we want to say, oh, we really appreciate you. We want to be diverse. We want to be inclusive. We want, you know, we want to do that. But then open mouth, insert foot, or do something grabbing someone physically, you know. So that's why this, like I said, this discussion is so important to say, you know, wh what what would have been the better response with that, right? But to Absolutely. your point about this Caucasian woman, she just wants to say, you know what, I support you. I'm, you know. I'm glad you're here in Bend, whatever, right? But just a little bit over the top. There's my couple of cents on awesome. that. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Suzanne. Anyone else would like to kind of throw in their input of that kind of scenario? No, it's okay, no worries. So let me explain my perspective. Um, so after she said that, there was another awkward pause and then she was like, well, you know, maybe you're, you're a tourist or, you know, you don't actually live here and, you know, whatnot. It was very awkward. And so, you know, of course I recognized where she was coming from, that she was trying to express again, that she was um, advocating and she was um, wanting to support this movement. However, when, when I received that, it felt like it was even more of an expression of, of difference, of highlighting differences, highlighting the fact that it's, it's very obvious, like a beacon that says, you are not one of us, you are not one of us, you don't belong even though it was coming from a place of trying to be inclusive. And so what I would like to express is that um, when we're in this kind of new ground of trying to, to be like, okay, I recognize that there's a problem. This is a very powerful place that we're in right now to be able to uh, be in this place of like, okay, there's shifting sands. We can do better. We can create better paradigms of inclusion. How do we do that? Okay. And so I feel for me, when Miguel was going over the slides, that it, it is, you can start by looking at the situation in an in individual situation and determining are you looking at it from a place or attempting to look at it from a place of sympathy? or are you attempting to look at it from a place of empathy, okay? So if you're looking at it from a place of sympathy, you're like, oh, wow, I feel so bad, or I, you know, I really wanna be able to align myself with that, but still within your own box. You're in your box, looking at a, looking at a, a, a situation, looking externally, still in an, a me versus them, or you know what I mean? Like, we're not the same. I'm trying to sympathize with you, but, I'm very much comfortable in this little box of perception. And so from this box of perception, this seems like an appropriate response versus, and you know, of course we know that the definition of, of empathy is about actually being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and then being able to empathize with that person from that perspective. And so if you're a Caucasian 
you know, whatever, female, male, what have you, and you're from, say, you know, small, small town in, in Oregon, Lapine, or what have you, you know what I mean, where you don't typically see a lot of diversity, but you are wanting to be able to recognize, hey, these subtle, you know, maybe um, aspects of, of just, uh, I don't know the right term, but like, we all have levels of, of um, stereotyping or, you know, potential races. And, you know, let's just call it for what it is. We have ancestrally from our families, different levels of racist or stereotypical beliefs. And that's just life. Let's, let's call a spade a spade, right? You know, and it's not just the Caucasians. Um, the Hispanics have it as well. African Americans, like we all have our own individual um, passed down beliefs of racial, you know, differences or stereotypical differences. But when we are attempting to break those barriers down, allow yourself to be completely honest. But then, okay, if I were that other person, if she were that woman going back to Target, if she were me. How would she be, take like an iota of a second to think, would I want to be stopped in the middle of my shopping experience for some random stranger to say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I appreciate you. Uh, okay, I'm a human being breathing and shopping just like you. I don't see you stopping the other lady that's right across here, this other person over here only me, you know? And so how would that make you feel? Would you feel included or would you feel excluded? You know, how would you feel, put yourself in the situation of your daughter, you know, or your child and someone were to pull your child aside and say, hey, I just wanted to let you know, I know there's not a lot of people in this town that look like you, but I just wanna let you know that I appreciate you for growing up in this town. Would you want your child to have like that kind of, um, spotlight or maybe feel like that was kind of let's just say a microaggression potentially so I feel like you know um, intentions are, are important but with this new um, all new environment that we are in where we're working on creating new structures and new paradigms of inclusion I invite you to just take a moment to okay your knee jerk is response is to maybe grab someone and tell them that i appreciate you but take a moment to take it to that next step take it to that next level of okay if i were in their shoes how would that make me feel um and and see if that changes what that response would be because of course we all want to come together and collaborate to create you know new levels of integration in our society and our in our diverse you know, cultural backgrounds. However, how are we doing that? What kind of foundation are we trying to build these changes with? And so, um, yeah, so that's kind of my personal um, story and input that I thought could provide value for this discussion. Thank you guys. And if y'all have any questions for me regarding what I just discussed, please don't hesitate. No, Elaine, it's it's fantastic that I, I will just give the, the, the voice to Dawn, but it's fantastic that you introduce the three important other topics that were not in the definitions. So one is implicit bias, right? We all have implicit bias. So and 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 the the, the AMSO model that we show that it's one strategy to approach that, but yes, we all have that. So it's 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 totally normal. Recognizing that we have it is the first step for sure. So thank you for that. The other idea that you introduce it's uh, this idea that minorities have accumulated and historical trauma, and that is very pertinent for your group, right? So there is there is a psychological historical trauma associated with being a minority. So being, being uh, understand that it's, it's an important part of the, of the healing process. And then the, what was the third point that you touched? I forgot, but so I, I leave, it will come. So I leave down to answer because I think she, she knows about trauma and, and yeah. yeah. 
Well, and I think we maybe had one more audience question from yeah. Martina. Can you unmute yourself? Unmute yourself, Martina. Martina, you have to unmute yourself. Where is she? There, there you is. are. There you are. Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, we can't hear you. Can you type your question in the box or? I can hear her a little bit. I think it's something about your speaker. I can barely, oh. barely hear you. Um, something I just want to throw out really quick is yes, we have to hear from Dawn. But um, Elaine, something that you had said on that Friday when we were discussing this, like what, what is this conversation going to look like and sound like today? I remember you saying something about just to be acknowledged, like if someone could have looked at you and smiled at you. Unfortunately, with the masks, that's not very you know, possible right now. But even sometimes when you smile, your eyes can be like smile. But that's the kind of easier just to look at you, to acknowledge you and just smile at you, right? Yeah. But yes. don't we give that courtesy or shouldn't we give that courtesy to everybody? But totally. in particular, people of color to say, you know, hey, I see you. I see you. Right. And, and yeah. You're, you're welcome here kind of thing. So hopefully that's totally. gonna come sooner that we can show the smiles on our faces and acknowledge through that way. So so thank you for sure. sharing that story. Yes. Yeah, you're so welcome. And so I just wanted to say, so the smiling with your eyes, Tyra Banks has put a term to that, it's called smizing. So we're all smizing right now. <laughs> so <laughs> don't hesitate to smize to anyone you need to. But um, yeah, and so I just want to briefly just state that um, what I had said was that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be this huge, you know, expression of, oh, I'm an advocate, blah, blah, blah. It's like, treat me like an, an, an ordinary human being that you would see at the store. And so like Suzanne said, what I had mentioned on Friday was that means simply look me in the eyes, smile at me, acknowledge my existence and then go about your day, just like you would do with literally anyone else. That's all I need. And, and I'm not like the spokesperson for, you know, the minorities in, you know, the world or in Bend. But um, at least for me and my perspective, you don't, there doesn't have to be this huge expression um, on like a regular day to day interaction. You know, if you see that you say a minority person, a person of color is in a state of distress or there's some kind of, you know, obvious emergency that they're going through, extend a helping hand. I mean, it's, it's pretty much the, what we've been taught of how to help and treat others let's express that to um, people of color as well. And, and in terms of like day-to-day -day interactions and then be a part of say these kinds of conversations, be a part of any you know, grassroots movements that are happening in your com community to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and that's where it would be more of like a very, ex you know, very directed, expressive, you know, potentially transformative, you know, kind of, a situation that you'd be in, but just be using that awareness, I feel, in terms of what's appropriate and when it's appropriate. So, thank you. Thanks. So yeah, much. I'd, Martin, I'd like to did that answer your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And well, and I wanted just a quick comment of for Elaine, uh, just even like, um, you know, if you're not, if you don't know or haven't seen someone, um, I would be interested culturally. I mean, if it's different, um, I would, it would be nice to have a conversation and like, you know, get to know you or, or, you know, say if you had an accent or you looked different, just even to kind of broach that subject and just instead of like, I mean, and besides showing, you know, some appreciation or something, but if you're interested I mean, I, I think unfortunately we've lost some of that interest of trying to learn about different cultures and different people. Um, we, we start making assumptions about something right away instead of trying to get to know each other, trying to learn, because um, there's, there's a lot of things that can be similar or we would have some common ground. So um, it's kind of, it's sad that that is some of where we are of like, I mean, she was trying to, trying to be helpful, but in the end that really isn't 
I mean, that's more, it, it puts you guys, it puts all of us on guard when you have somebody come up to you and do it that way. So, um, well, and I think, just, um, and I really, th I was thinking back to Miguel's slide and thinking, you know, we're living in this amazing time where, you know, we're, it, you know, the trifecta of the global pandemic and economic recession and a serious cultural movement, the biggest one we've had since the 1960s, where we're actually talking about race and Black Lives Matter and how to do this stuff and what does this terminology mean? And so this woman in, in Target had, you know, some, the, some environmental factors influencing her and then she had some motivation, but she didn't have the skills, right, to actually know how to handle that situation. And I think, you know, you know, that leads me, I think, to something, I don't know, the sort of topic for today is like what professionally and personally how changes have we made or what has this year meant to us? And I think, you know, as a white woman, um, I, you know, I think have used this year as an opportunity to really f figure out how, what I can do professionally to really think about diversity, equity, and inclusion in everything that I do. And I would like to have thought that prior to this year that I did that, I'm a background in sociology and learned a lot. I, I mean, so my entire professional education was focused on inequalities um, and, you know, but it, the thing is, is that it just falls through the cracks unless you make it an explicit thing. Right. So like I'm planning this professional conference and I'm like, you know, months into it and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I have all of these speakers and no people who identify as a person of color. And I was like, I set out and I was like, I want it is important to me to highlight, you know, people of color and minority voices. And I set out to make sure that I was identifying and including as many of those people as I can. And, and it takes additional effort and it takes work and it takes conversations, um, but it's not something that we can just sort of give lip service to and, and expect it to happen. And so for, I think on a professional level, that's something that I'm really committed to going forward in my work. On a personal level, I have ha had the opportunity to have so many conversations with my adult daughter, Tyler, who's joining us today. She's a senior in college and because of the pandemic, she's home living with me, which is, I feel really fortunate. And my daughter is um, mixed, her biological father is black. And, um, you know, we moved to Central Oregon about two years ago from Portland. And not that Portland has a ton of diversity, but it does have more than Central Oregon. And we talked a lot, I mean, that was the one downside of the potential move to Bend was the lack of diversity. And we talked a lot about that. And, you know, I think I, I talked with Tyler and I do have permission to share some of her um, experiences today and what we talked about, but I do think that, you know, she wanted to convey that she hasn't had any specific bad experiences here in Central Oregon since she's lived here. However, one of the things that I think I've really come to appreciate this year, and again, this was through so many conversations, and I'm fortunate as a white person that I have someone that I can talk to about these conversations, but the real meaning of white privilege. And so, and, you know, so, so thinking about the woman in Target, right, and, and how, and how she could have handled it differently. You know, we all have bad days, and maybe we all maybe potentially are maybe rude to someone in Target at some point, because you're just trying to get in and get what you need and get out, right. But when you're a person of color, and somebody is rude to you, or, or doesn't, you know, um, treat you well, like, it's in the back of your mind that perhaps they treated you that way because of the color of your skin. And as a white person, we never have to think about that. And the reverse is also true, which I think has this historical you know, trauma for people of color. When something positive happens to you, you have to be thinking in the back of your head, oh, did I only get that scholarship or did I only get that job because of the color of my skin? And that cumulative impact of having to constantly wonder in the back of your head if you're being treated differently because of the color of your skin is something that we as white people will never experience. And it's something that makes me sad. It makes me sad that my daughter has to think about that on a daily basis. 
and it's a part of who she is in our culture. But um, I do want to share something else that I know Tyler felt was really important. And I also want to invite her if she feels comfortable to unmute and talk as well. But we talked a lot about how, um, you know, a lot of what's happening now in our culture um, over the, and it's really intensified, especially over the last year, really has to do with Trumpism um, and how that has emboldened um, white supremacists and, and people to perhaps say things and act differently than they would have before and felt like it was okay. Um, and I know that for Tyler in particular, um, you know, like we have a, a house on our block that flies a Trump flag and, you know, um, walking, you just have to, she often, you know, she has to wonder um, when is that person gonna feel emboldened um, to potentially do something? And, and that's something again, as white people, uh, our white privilege, we never, we don't have to think about that stuff. I mean, and I think how scary the world can be um, and all the things that happen to all of us, we've all had things, a traumatic background or hard upbringing or things that are happening to us now, but to add on that whole layer of racism and discrimination on top of that, I think is, this year has really um, given me the opportunity to really think about white privilege in a, in a whole new way. Great, thank you, Dawn. Um, does anyone have any questions about what's been talked about so far? There's, there's so much here. There's a lot of um, rich information um, that's been shared. The definitions um, I think are really helpful for all of us. Um, and this is just a starting point, um, being here, starting to have this, this conversation and continuing the conversation with open minds and open hearts. Um, it's, uh, for me, it's really encouraging. Um, there's gonna be fits and starts wherever we go. There's gonna be you know a little bit of backsliding before we make a lot of progress, but I think we're on the right track. Um, so Miguel or Dawn or Elaine, do you have anything else that you'd like to impart to the folks here for continuing education, tools they might use, other resources that might be helpful um, to look into this some more? I'd like to before and please unmute yourself, you guys, and you know make sure you chime in. Yeah, because to Cheryl's point, it goes back to Miguel's first slide. I think we're at that five percent, and we're kind of moving up the scale, like we're opening up the conversation. That's a starting point, right? And which is good, because um, I always use the analogy, and I and I don't know, it might not be a good one, but sometimes the pendulum swings from one way to the other. You know, I'd really love it sometimes just to stop and how do you bring that together, you know, and um, yeah, because sometimes, yeah, it just goes, because to, to your point, Dawn, which was a very good one, uh, um, about thinking about, you know, if I'm a person of color, did I get that promotion because I'm a person of color or because I, I deserve that, right, kind of thing. I, that's why, and I know I've gotten in trouble from this, and, and Dawn, I think you've tried to educate Kate me on this, but that I say I'm colorblind. And, and personally, what I mean by that is, I don't care what the color of your skin is. If you deserve that promotion, if you deserve, I, it shouldn't matter. I know, I, and Miguel, I see you shaking or going like this. I want you to educate me. So please unmute yourself, anybody else. But this is that conversation that I want to acknowledge you that you are a person of color or you know whatever color that is. It could be white, white, yellow, brown, black, whatever. I, I really feel that it, it should be based on not the color of your skin or your background. It should be, am I qualified for that job or that whatever? So I will leave it at that. And Miguel or somebody, you oh, could educate me. <laughs> it's, it's so important what you said, Suzanne, because if you if you listen to Lays and Don with what she, she were sharing, it was about that it's important to recognize the difference. So saying that it is that I don't see difference is not recognizing that. It's the same as saying uh, all lives matter. Well, yes, all lives matter for sure. But now we are talking about black lives matter. So we need to 
put attention into that. So that's a similar reaction, saying that I don't see color, I don't, for me it makes no difference. It's, it's, uh, it could be um, misleading because color does count. And it, it, it has a, a, a historical, it, it, it brings an historical trauma in our society because it makes difference. So it's better to recognize the difference and then move forward and say, I recognize your color, I recognize your history, I recognize your challenge. And for me, it, it doesn't count. I want to make the difference. I want to create the inclusive space. So that's, uh, but my comment that I wanted to say is that the, we are talking about differences that are visible, right? And remember the first slide I told you? So I told about many other uh, minorities that are suffering being outside of the system of power. And, and I think the system is so intelligent that it finds the way to put, to find people that is guilty or to put minorities ones against other. And in, uh, obviously we, we, we have the struggle with minorities of color. We need to put attention on that. And that is why it's so important to openly talk about racism, segregation and all lives on all black, black Lives Matter. It's important for that. But let's not forget that what we are living is a struggle of poor people versus very, very rich people and nothing in the middle. So it is every, all this racial situation, it's also in a bigger system that we don't need, that we need to remember and not forget because it is about the way that the system, economical system uh, functions. So uh, it, it, that affects us all, uh, color people and, and white people, and it, 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 it's something that we don't, that we need to keep in mind. So mm -hmm. that no, that's a great point. I, I appreciate you saying that. Cause sometimes, um, and please people unmute yourself. Cause this is a great time. Cause we still have 10 whole minutes. That's awesome. <laughs> and we're not like rushing through it, you know? So we really invite everyone to be part of this conversation. Um, we want all voices to be heard. Right. But, uh, cause, and this is another way that I always want to be educated. You know, when I hear, you know, people, um, white privilege, I, when I think of that word for me, I wasn't privileged. You know, we grew up, pretty poor. We were on food stamps or we were on, you know, that kind of thing. I'm from a divorced family, um, you know, different things like that. So when I hear the white privilege word, I, I always, you know, well, what does that mean exactly? Because I, I don't feel that I, I was privileged. I didn't live a privileged life. So maybe Dawn or Elaine, would you like to um, address that or talk about that? Um, Dom, if you want to jump in on that, I do know just in regards to my friends, I've heard the exact same kind of sentiment from a lot of my white friends as well that, or, you know, came from a similar background. They're like, I came from a broken home and we didn't have money and I had to scrape and, you know, do all this stuff for all of my opportunities and achievement. And so I do feel like, so there's terms that are triggering for people of color. I feel like white privilege is a triggering term for white people. And so I think that that's really important to kind of unpack um, what is meant by white privilege. But then also it's, I almost feel like it's, it, it's perceived as like an attack or something for, for, for Caucasians. And so um, I, I, I personally feel like it seems to need to be Again, this is, I don't have the training that Miguel has. This is all experiential for me, um, but it, it's a case by case basis, you know? And I think that again, it kind of goes back into what I was saying previously about the sympathy versus empathy, right? If you're in like your own box perspective and you're like, well, this is me and this is my experience. And, but yet with all of this has come to the forefront in 2020, you know, it's forcing us to look at things that we've not had to look at maybe since like Don said, since the sixties, right? And so um, when we start to look at that and we're looking at it from the my box perspective, 
then that triggers. That's a triggering kind of statement. That's a triggering kind of comment because then it's like, well, I've had to fight for everything anyway. And I'm, you know, white or what have you. Um, but then, you know, and it's, it's such a hairy kind of subject. Um, but I feel like at least in the first step from my perspective would be, okay, I understand that I know from my experience that, you know, I wasn't given any kind of handouts in life. But if we start to try to step outside of our box and approach the situation from more of an, an empathy kind of perspective, but then also dropping your personal story and then looking at our, 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 our story of race and you know segregation and whatnot, looking at that entire picture without your story, trying to step away from your story. And then reevaluating the definition of white privilege because it, I feel almost like people feel like it's a personal attack and it's not a personal attack. It's okay, what is it that, um, am I able to kind of look at the whole big picture? So that's yeah. kind of my two cents on that. Thank you, Elaine. That makes a lot of sense. And Stephanie, would you like to chime in on this conversation? Yeah, yes. Um, so I just have a couple of comments, not necessarily questions, but first of all, I appreciate all of you guys sharing your experiences and your feelings um, about those experiences, because it's obviously something that I personally have never experienced myself, like Elaine, what you experienced in the store. Um, so I really appreciate the vulnerability and coming to talk to us today. Um, Suzanne, you're kind of, con so I'm in a social work, social justice program with Portland State right now. And so we've talked about white privilege a lot. And so I just kind of wanted to chime in on that conversation as well in that I also grew up super poor in Portland. You know, there was, you know, whatever, we had powdered milk and there was gunshots at the church down the street, you know, whatever. But I've never had to walk into a store and be treated differently or looked at like I shouldn't be there. I've never been refused service because of how I look or my cultural background, you know. So that is kind of what I think they talk about with white privilege. You and I have that privilege of not having to experience those injustices. It's not just down to um, kind of more materialistic things. It's not down to what we had necessarily, but there's you know systemic systemic racism that causes people of color to tend to stay in poverty, where you and I maybe we grew up in poverty, but we've had more opportunities afforded to us to get out of that and change our life where that's not necessarily the case for people of color, the BIPOC population. So I think that's where the kind of confusion is because I used to think the same thing too. Like I haven't really been super privileged, you know? I mean, we grew up really poor and we have, you know, we had our own whatever, but I think that it's not such a literal translation of the word as more of kind of our behaviors. Like Elaine was saying, I don't know about you, but I've never had that. I've had some really weird experiences with people out in public, okay? But I've never had an experience from that side of things about, you know, um, my culture or my background or my whatever. Um, but Elaine, that's something that, you know, happened to her and probably has before and or will again. And while I was listening to that story, there was a couple things that popped into my mind is that we need to be really mindful of how we approach certain topics and we need to be intentional on in what we say around them and I think I hope that lady at Target had a really positive intention <laughs> um but there but a couple of things like I don't I don't know about you but I wouldn't feel comfortable with somebody just grabbing my arm in the store so why would I want to do that to somebody else a and b we're in a pandemic so let's respect that also, <laughs> you know, I mean, there was just so many things about that story. I'm like, what is going on with this lady? Um, but I appreciate you uh, explaining like your point of view from it. Cause you know, it's going to be different than how I'm hearing it from you. Um, but I think just really being mindful on how we have these conversations, being open, hearing from other people's experiences is super important. And as long as we just keep the conversation going, we'll, a little bit at a time, you know, make that progress. So thank you all for sharing. I really appreciate it. Amen, sister. <laughs> uh, Stephanie is with the uh, Nash, uh, NAMI, the National Association of Mental, correct me, National Association. The, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. On Mental Illness, mm. thank Central Oregon. Yes. Yeah, so, 
thank you for your your input with that, Stephanie. Yeah, I know we're running out of time, but Dawn, did you have a couple of things you wanted to say? Because you had unmuted yourself. Well, yeah, I was trying to just be conversational, but um, I mean, I think Stephanie hit the nail on the head. I mean, with, I think part of this year has been me becoming totally comfortable with owning my white privilege and recognizing that that doesn't mean I haven't had other types of hardships. I just haven't ever had the hardship of being discriminated against because of the color of my skin and recognizing that that is something that I will never experience in a whole nother layer of trauma and experiences and obstacles that I will never have to face. And so I think, you know, part of it's just getting comfortable with that. Yes, Tyler. Tyler, yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'll speak really quickly because I know we're running out of time. No um, worries. No, we love to hear from the young, a young perspective too, yeah. right? A younger perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, just going back to white privilege, I think that because I, I know a lot of people are like, how do I talk to people about this? Like, how do I explain white privilege in a way that people can understand? And it's very difficult and hard to, to explain. And um, I actually was talking with someone, I took a, a course called Management of Diversity. Um, my last term in college, it was a great course. And we use an example, which I think is a perfect example. Um, it might get under some people's skin, but I think that that's necessary. And that's the example of um, uh, policemen and cops. And um, a great example with that is, you know, um, every day cops get up, they wake up, they put on a uniform and they go to work. And you know, some people hate cops and they will do anything to harass them, to go after them. They just don't like cops. You don't know why, they just don't. And they feel like they have a target on their back when they're at work every single day. And that's a horrible feeling. And then they come home and they take off their uniform and they don't have that target anymore. And people who are people of color and identify as that they're wearing the uniform all the time and they cannot take the uniform off. And I think that is the, just that's a great example of white privilege is it has nothing to do with how you grew up or what you had or didn't have. It has everything to do with how other people perceive you and their stereotypes of you and whether or not you are capable of staying in your box, kind of what Elaine was saying of being in your own world. When they take that uniform off, they can say, oh, okay, I don't have to worry about that anymore. It's gone. No one knows I'm a cop. It's fine. But with people of color, that's not something that they can hide necessarily. So having that target on your back all the time is really difficult and try to really be empathetic and thinking about that of, wow, this person has to deal with that every single day. They can't take it off. I wonder how that feels. And so I think that if you're talking with someone and they're really struggling to grasp the white privilege concept, that's a great example to use. And hopefully it'll kind of open the door to more conversation around, around that. Wow. Can I just say what a proud mom I am for a moment? <laughs> can I just say that you should be? <laughs> that was beautiful. So and, what, and you know what? That wraps it up beautifully. Thank you, Tyler, for being part of that conversation and wrapping us up so nicely. Um, but having said that, Cheryl, any closing thoughts or Maria, any closing thoughts? I would just say, you know, thank you, first of all, to our presenters today. You guys have been amazing and um, we really appreciate all of your time. Um, so keep the conversation going, whatever that means for you um, to either integrate it into your life or your organization, um, find out what it is that, that you can do to keep moving this um, conversation forward. And um, thanks so much for being here. Uh, as this has been recorded, um, and you think that there's somebody that you might know who would be interested in watching it, it'll be on the Halen House um, website, which is halenhouse.org. So you can point people to that. They'll be able to pull it up and watch it. And um, let's keep talking. Let's keep that conversation yes. going. All thank right, everybody. You. Thank you for thank this you so much. Thank you, thank Thanks. you, speakers. So much love, love about everyone. Everyone, enjoy yeah, your day. You, All right, bye bye. Mm -hmm. Happy holidays.